culturally, right, when you from over east, over west is like that place on the Lion King where it's like the light, the light, the, the all everywhere that the light touches is ours, and then don't go over there. So that's basically like how I was growing up in East Baltimore. It was really just kind of people in East Baltimore kind of connected to one another. Very, very proximate. Very, very um, integrally connected in terms of like work, community, everything else. So I never really had a need to venture west. And when I did, um, I made sure that I had all my right peoples and stuff. Um, that's culturally. Socially, I mean, it's not really too, too, too crazily different. I mean, you got critical masses of black people on both sides of the black butterfly. Um, and what do you mean by the black butterfly? Explain oh, that's that's Lawrence Brown. He um he created this way to basically articulate where the wealth gap is in Baltimore City, basically chronicling like the apartheid here. Um, he describes what goes down the center of the city and then across. Canton, so as the white L, where majority white families and white wealth has been here since like 1927. And then there's the L part where the new development is. So there's that outside of that though, is this butterfly shaped space, which basically is where all the black people live, or majority of them. And that's where you will find all of the like, Drug issues, right? Like Baltimore is 80 point, I think six square miles. It's 5.25 square miles where almost all the violent crimes happen. Those crimes almost, like those three hot spots where the majority of those murders happened last year all come from places inside the butterfly. Mm -hmm. And it is not like a coincidence, right? Like his, to the point that you would make it historically, uh, when you ain't got no money, you ain't got no money. And that's just kind of how stuff shape up. Um, where there is poverty, there's crime. And that's just kind of how stuff is. Um, but it's really kind of the same place. It's just not the same place. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. Baltimore's a city of neighborhoods. And I stay in my neighborhood. Um, first, you had communities, which is like growing, active, living ecosystems of people who connect off one another and thrive. But then you stop having community and then people kind of move out, move away. You get black flight and you get white flight and then you get mass incarceration and crack and all the rest of that stuff historically. And basically you end up with um, a pattern of people not necessarily investing here and operating in ways where when they are good, so to speak, they um, take their goodness and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. In what ways have you seen uh, major institutions in Baltimore either play a part of, of kind of like that um, divesting in certain communities or investing in certain communities? In what ways have you kind of seen that play out across the city? It's a bunch of ways. Um, you could ride down Monument Street and see all of the stores that used to be open and up and vibrant with small and middle sized businesses booming. You could drive down Penn North and look at what is now the Black Arts District, but before that was a vibrant, booming black community with a whole bunch of stuff going on. And now it's a whole bunch of like chipped paint brick buildings with like a tree growing through the middle of it which I'm not even really sure what level of disrepair you got to get to to like start having trees growing through the middle of your house. But you get like all of that stuff. And then like right down the street, as you get closer to the L, you'll get further away from the butterfly parts of the neighborhoods, you'll find more and more investment. You'll find places like the zip code 21210, which is like an entirely created zip code from money that came from the Roland Park Development Corporation and British money from way, way, way back in when. And that's like found in a book, Not In My Neighborhood, right? Like, but ultimately what you'll find is as you get closer to the center, you'll find um, resource and capacity, which is usually the difference that makes the difference for a lot of the other stuff that happens in terms of environmental stuff. Mm -hmm. So going back to what you were saying about historic Baltimore, um, what kind of legislation or um, what things were kind of instituted 
um, that created what we see today. Do you know a little bit about that? Trifling. <laughs> I don't know. You so, in 1909, there was a guy, A.W. Hawkins, who was a lawyer who was trying to move into 1834 McCullough Street. House still stands today. It's actually a really crappy house now that I look at it in like retrospect, kind of realizing all this stuff blew up. But basically, he moved into the house and white guy was on the block, majority white block. And there was a councilman who happened to live on that block. Councilman was pissed off, didn't like it, decided that they was going to go and create some rules and some laws, some regulations, some policies, some policies and procedures for how to make sure that you don't have this issue anymore. And that actually started like the premise for the first redlining um, pieces of policy across the country. That happened in 1909, and actually, fun fact, it didn't get passed until 1911 because the people in city council at the time when that uh, council person brought that, that resolution forward and was like, hey, I don't want black people to be able to live where I want them to live around here. The people on the council was like, you're bugging me. You're wilding. I don't even know why that makes sense to you. Why you get to be special? I want to have, I want to be able to tell people where they can't live too. And so then they took another two years to actually like figure out the language on it. And in 1911, it was actually passed. Well, anyway, no, nah, but um, seriously, so city is like historically got a whole lot of stuff. But I mean, I don't really know. It's like, where do you want to start? First of all, it was all boys school for a long time. It was a majority white male school for a long time. And actually, like, there's a thing about Baltimore City that a lot of people don't know. Like, people know Baltimore's a gatekeeper city. What people don't realize is, like, how those gatekeeper politics play in the stuff. So, like, magnet schools like City, Poly, Western, to some extent, depending on how far back you go, even Lake Clifton, which was a business school at one point. Each of these magnet schools kind of have been the training grounds for the thought leaders of the next generations, very explicitly and implicitly. Whether you're talking about like um, intentionally funneling students from elementary schools to middle schools so that they can specifically land at that school, or whether you're talking about having that be one of the few schools that's protected by like a historical landmark site. So there are some things around um, school closures or um, sustainability or knowing whether or not your stuff will be there next year that city just doesn't have to think about. Um, traditionally, because they are so well resourced on the front end or have been so well resourced, alumni have been pretty good to the school um, over time. I think they raise about $90,000 a year in alumni scholarships, which isn't a huge amount of money, but it's more than, say, a Carver might be able to have or a Douglas may be able to have. Um, I think there's a bunch of other stuff that goes into it partially just down to um, even the amount of money that people have had. Um, City happens to have a decent sized building. There are some programs or some schools, because they call schools programs. There's some schools that don't have a big enough building for them to be able to do some stuff. So, like, even down to the amount of resources people got, right? Like, in Baltimore City, it's pure pupil funded. And so you get money per pupil. So, the more kids you got, the more grades you got. And so, the thing with that is, City is the capacity to hold 1,300 students which inherently gives it a larger budget size than, say, a school that can only hold five or 600. And of course, more resource allows you to do a tons and tons and tons of different stuff. So um, city ain't just get like that. People made city like that. People have been keeping city like that. City has been a very intentional ecosystem building tool by both black people and white people who are part of all of the uh, political spaces here and it's also been like the cheap option to get a good school it's a lot of white folk here who send their kids to that little corridor right up and down the white l where there's all of the private schools your Brimma, your gilman your friend school your all of those things all the way down 
And what will happen is those parents will get, those classes will get too expensive by the time they hit high school. And so people will kind of figure out that they can get a comparable experience for like the private school at like a city or poly, but have it for free. And so rather than spending the money on tuition, they do this, which is a really, really interesting concept because I'm pretty sure that these are still the same people who, while they were spending money on tuition, they were not contributing in other ways. And so whatever ways that, or whatever status the schools were in before they got there, they probably will not benefit in any way from that particular family in the same way that the private schools did because they require and necessitate resource. Meanwhile, like the entire point of operating in those spaces at that point is like to exacerbate and like extract the resource out of the public schools in that like I can save up for college if I don't got to pay for high school. My name's Mark, I'm an alcoholic. Dorothy T, and I am an alcoholic. For so long, alcohol has sort of been there for me to sort of see me through social situations. Drinking was more important than anything else. My journey in AA started years ago when I reached the outside limits of my desperation. I really wanted to quit drinking. I just couldn't stop on my own. And you know, I remember when I woke up on the day that I got sober, I felt something inside of me tell me that I could go to AA. These people, you know, just gathered around me. That was the fellowship in action in my life. The moral of my story today is that AA has never let me down, ever. If I carry any sort of message with my story, it's that you know, keep coming back, and that this thing does work. If you have a problem with alcohol, contact AA. It works. How do you change history? You can change history by walking and marching. You can change history by speaking and teaching. You can change history by taking a stand or taking a seat. But the best way to change history is when you becomes we. We tore down that wall. We marched for equality. We made sure that love knew no boundaries. Now you can become we right here in Vancouver. We can end HIV. We can change history. It begins with a test. Testing today can range from a blood test that'll inform you in about a week to some locations where a prick of the finger gets you a result in 60 seconds. Diagnosing HIV early changes everything. It prevents the virus from attacking your body, and it prevents it from spreading through our communities. All each of us has to do is step up and take a test. Changing history is that simple. Testing centers are available throughout the city, or just ask your doctor at your next regular visit. And if your doctor offers a test, say yes. It's just the responsible thing to do. Then, share the word. Tell people that HIV treatment has changed. Tell people that testing has advanced. Tell people that the entire approach to HIV is different now. Let them know that by choosing to take a test, we can all end HIV. This is a fact. We are so close. But to become we, we've got to have you. We need you to do your part. We need you to share the word, take the test, join the movement. End HIV. Change history. Learn more at itsdifferentnow.org.
I was in solid C student. You feel me? Straight C's. You feel me? C's get degrees. No, um, I was a solid C student, but that was because I spent a lot of time doing stuff. So I did debate. I did choir, all four levels of choir. I did um, wrestling. I wrestled 125. I played basketball. I was a point guard. Um, I had a girlfriend, uh, several uh, siblings, and I also worked algebra project at the time. So for me, having a C was really an A because I knew people who were in the IB programs at City, primarily those little white um, Roland Park kids who had been funneled there, who didn't have to do anything except kind of homework and hang out. Meanwhile, I was like, um, I actually didn't get a debate very, very long. I started debating, I like started working through Boodle, um, but I didn't really like it too much. I think I came into policy debate at a point where speed reading was just kind of the thing. And uh, just kind of introducing or being introduced to people in debate through Boodle that did not align with the like structure of Boodle at the time. That's the Baltimore Urban Debate League, but basically like major white philanthropic organization trying to like teach policy debate to poor black kids with no expectation of people actually transition into or being competitive at a national scale, which was like, that's just generally off putting all together. So step back from the beat. And that was like the extent of that. But I got connected to a lot of my big brothers and a lot of mentors, a lot of like intellectual and thought partners that really stick with me to the day. It's the norm for Black Baltimore if you got some self-respect. Explain that. Um, I think every day that people choose not to sell drugs or choose to sell drugs, they are choosing to either eat or to not eat, to starve or to not starve. And I think that it just takes a different kind of person to be like, I'm just going to starve. And in a city where everybody kind of pride themselves on their integrity and their like wherewithal, it it does not work long term for you to be like, yeah, no, nah, I just mm, it, it's not a thing. And so that's kind of where you the kind of mindset you were in like, when you were. Well, I mean, there's that. So nobody wants to be a liability, right? And so for me, growing up. That was like the major thing. It was, um, how do I make it so that I don't have any of these other issues that other people are having? So like for, and I guess I'm, I'm doing the thing where you walk around the thing. All right, so to the point. Um, my grandfather died when I was 11. And that was the only male figure that I had. And it probably wouldn't have mattered if I had others. That was it. And when that happened, I kind of needed a space to be, needed somewhere to be. I couldn't really be around my mother, my grandmother, none of the rest of them. And at that point, I had already been put out of my middle school. So I was like in this new private school with no friends and kind of extradited or like separated away from all of my people. And grandfather just passed and that was like my best friend. So I started being outside all the time. And then the big homies up the street, just kind of being outside. One day you go from them, you know, I'll be all time quarterback. Let me pass the ball for y'all. And then the next time it's like, yo, I'm trying to eat. Well, I'm not gonna keep feeding you, little, you bag will feed yourself. I'm gonna make sure that you're good. And eventually you just kind of slide into that. And the more independent you are, the more likely you are to just end up in that space. Um, just mostly because it's either eat or die, right? Like, and there were moments that I had, I remember in like the eighth grade, where there would be stuff in the house that would just be not right. For and example? My eighth grade year, I asked for $500 for Christmas, some jerseys, and some PlayStation games. And I knew I was being excessive, but I also knew that I had the right away because in the sixth grade, I got put out of my middle school for starting a riot. 
And so I spent like two, three, two years at this point basically building stuff back up. And I was like, all right, they just happy. I'm not getting in trouble. Let me milk this. So I got all the stuff. I got the $500 because I wanted to go buy gifts. I got the jerseys because if you got money and you got clothes, you don't need nothing else. And I had the games because if I'm not outside, I'm being here just doing this. So I'm just prepared to go buy gifts and look cute and be cut and just be in the house, right? And that night, I sat up all night, I played the game, I beat the game. And then the next morning, uh, I decided I was gonna go watch TV. So I left out of the room, went downstairs, grabbed a bowl of cereal, come back upstairs, turn the game off. I'm gonna turn the TV on and there's this weird ass static that look almost like my shit was off, except it was off. And I was like, oh, I don't even know what this is. I thought we was done with this, like, whatever. And I went in my mother room and I like busting the door. <laughs> Ma! Ma! What is going on? I'm like, like, I'm livid at this point. And she's like, the cable's off. And I'm like, well, why is the cable? She's like, because I ain't had the money to pay. I said, well, where's the money to pay? She said, you wearing it. And it was at that moment I stopped asking for gifts. And like to this day, I don't ask for birthday gifts. I don't ask for Christmas gifts. I don't ask for like Father's Day gifts. Like in general for me at that point, it became clear that um, even in a world where I'm in, a decent school, I got sets of people around me that care about me. There's this economic barrier that if I can't help chip away at it, it's going to detract from my experience growing up one way or the other. Whether that's like, I can't ask for the things that I want for Christmas because literally it means that the other 29 days of the month, I'll be without. And so, like, having to figure those things out. And that's what I mean by, like, self-respect. Like, ain't no, nobody that I know growing up in Baltimore was ready to watch their mother do that and be like, I could go make $300 and then at least take care of myself and not going to make that option. Especially given, like, the value proposition. You see so many people go outside and jump off the porch and be in the trenches out in the field making whatever plays. And what you know is that it worked. What you know is that money come in from it. And what you know is that you don't have that same feeling that you got. That whatever feeling that is that you got at the moment where it's like, mm, I actually don't want this jersey. You can take this bag. You can have these games. Like, but at that point, of course, no parent is about to do that. So I was becoming more and more aware of like, the dynamics that went into all those decisions. And I was sitting there thinking to myself when that actually happened. Like, yo, if I could just take care of myself. Like, I don't gotta be no kingpin. I don't gotta, like, you think you're balling because you got a blood. What? I don't gotta be all that. If I can set myself up in a way where I can cover myself, do what I'm supposed to do, make a couple dollars here and there, then ideally I can at least take that off of her so that she can focus on them. And even if that's like, so, for example, um, the reason I actually stopped trapping when I did stop trapping was because I found out of a project. So, um, explain to me what the Baltimore Algebra Project is, um, and also kind of give me the narrative behind how that was started. The Baltimore Algebra Project is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's based in Baltimore that does two things primarily youth development work through student advocacy and math literacy work because math literacy is important. Algebra Project just kind of erected itself after the civil rights movement. There was a field secretary, Bob Moses, at the time who basically, after the 70s was going on and they figured out that SNCC was splitting and everything else, they realized that the new access to citizenship wasn't going to be about voting. It was going to be about your access and your interactions with math and sciences. And so functionally, as a civil rights strategy, as a human development strategy, um, Bob Moses created the Algebra Project as like a tool to structurally and institutionally be able to combat this um, this new transformative issue because basically that's what happens. All these issues of racism always rebrand. So at that point it was like, how do you 
deal with that. And so basically we've been teaching math and doing organizing ever since then. Algebra Project, the reason why it was so important for me is because it hired young people to teach math and to do that. So like this is 2008 and I was first job making $10 an hour. Now, while I can do math, right? Like I can clearly tell this is not a whole lot of hours, but I can also say that I got $10 an hour. And I can also map out, all right, worst case scenario, I put in this number of hours, I get this check, I sit on this, I do this, I go highlight them, I get this, I go do it. And I can figure out money if I need to. But the important part was figuring out a base level of key support that I could get that would be regular, that was enough to keep me from going outside because I'd be this close to selling drugs all the time. Or that would keep me focused on doing other stuff so that I don't got time to do that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, out of the project was real integral because I wasn't going to make a decision that wasn't going to give me any money. I was making like two grand a week in like the ninth grade. And so, you were not about to tell me um, at the in the about the eleventh grade that I was supposed to like go to no money, and the problem was um, I didn't have a choice. My mother was a correctional officer, and so she had dealt with a whole bunch of like all the people on the outside when they go on the inside, right? And so um, basically, she had decided that if I didn't get my life together at the time, she was going to like send me to live with some family members I didn't want to. And so I like had to get myself together, but that meant I need to find some base level cash. I need to find somewhere to be, and I need to find some people to connect to because otherwise I'm gonna be outside because that's where my market is, and I'm really good at this. So it was really important for me to just connect to something else. Mm -hmm. No two days are alike. So every day, you prepare. For yourself. For those you love. For whatever the day may bring. Being prepared is a part of who you are. But in the case of a disaster, preparation isn't always front of mind. In an emergency when help and resources may not be available for days, being prepared is more important than ever. It's up to everyone to be informed about what types of emergencies might occur where you live or visit. Knowing the best responses for your personal circumstances is the key to maintaining your health, safety, and independence. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency and how a personal support network can assist you. Build a kit that contains the specific things you need to survive for several days. Food and water, medication and supplies, as well as any important documents you may need. Being prepared is a part of who you are and disaster preparation is no different. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, get involved ready.gov slash my plan. Somos madres, hermanos, abuelos y veteranos. Somos profesores, escritores, empleados y actores. Tenemos discapacidades desde nacer y otras que hemos adquirido. Además, estamos trabajando en puestos que nos fascinan porque se nos dio la oportunidad de contribuir nuestras habilidades y talentos para mostrar que nuestras discapacidades son solamente una parte de lo que somos. En el trabajo, lo que importa es lo que la gente puede hacer. Para más información, visite usted My name's Mark, I'm an alcoholic. Dorothy T, and I am an alcoholic. For so long, alcohol has sort of been there for me to sort of see me through social situations. 
Drinking was more important than anything else. My journey in AA started years ago, when I reached the outside limits of my desperation. I really wanted to quit drinking. I just couldn't stop on my own. And you know, I remember when I woke up on the day that I got sober. I felt something inside of me tell me that I could go to AA. These people, you know, just gathered around me. That was the fellowship in action in my life. The moral of my story today is that AA has never let me down, ever. If I carry any sort of message with my story, it's that, you know, keep coming back and that this thing does work. If you have a problem with alcohol, contact AA. It works. director just kind of teaching math or doing stuff. The organization has evolved into a student-led organization. We, almost all of the campaigns come from student organization conversations or like student-led conversations, student-facilitated conversations. All of the math work is done peer-to-peer. -peer. I mean, really what's happened is there's been this slow evolution of uh, in the Ubuntu co-op structure for a, a nonprofit organization that black youth run. So functionally, how do you take a nonprofit organization that's set up to traditionally kind of attack a social problem and a one-off, and how do you take that same structure and have it be able to develop all of these young people attached to it in a much more meaningful way. I mean, functionally, what it does is it takes that critique about, like, Buddha, where it's like, again... Yes, I'm a Buddha. Oh, Baltimore Urban Debate League. So, like, that, that thing about the Baltimore Urban Debate League, where traditional large white nonprofits kind of receive dollars and their services really just kind of lift up the staff members. Whereas with Algebra Project, because the staff members are the students and they all pay um, wages to do the tutoring, it actually lifts up the people who are the most directly impacted, providing the services, receiving the services, and also like in the space as mo at the, the most. It's really important. It's super duper important. I guess the, the major thing the major elements is like, you need three things for something to happen, time, space, and resource. And the resource part is the wealth part. And there's like Dr. Claude Anderson, who's written tons and tons and tons of books on stuff. He has this really good Breakfast Club interview that he just put out not that long ago, or they just dropped not that long ago, where he talks about like black people in like the, the inability of black Americans to be able to build wealth because the primary tool that we have when you don't have ownership for wealth is your labor. And what we've done is kind of transition into this economy where at first they weren't paying for the labor at all, now they pay the bare minimum and we're still trying to have a conversation about living as opposed to all these other things in terms of wages. But that, that black economic development is crucial, is vital. It's the only way to actually do any like institution building long term. Um, there are going to be institutions that are set up within community. And if those institutions are not building black collective power, if those institutions are not challenging anti-blackness, if those institutions are not resourcing those who are most directly impacted to do stuff, I mean, ultimately what you have is um, someone's going to get wealthy off of the actions or someone that wealth is going to get created one way or the other. So question of who is it for and off of whom's back. Mm -hmm. And so like part of the reason why black folk as a people are in a like perpetual state of having to try and climb out of the hole is because every time we actually build it up, white folk come take it because they understand like wealth creation as like the core folk, the core piece. And I guess the best example of that is like Black Wall Street, because everyone talks about it. But you got even more, like, very, very clear examples. Black Wall Street wasn't the only place that was booming. It was just one of the clearest examples because of the critical mass of black people and because they, literally the great migration is just, right? Like, 
And so that was the thing. But there were actually satellite sites of black folk all across the country, small pockets of like black economic development wealth that was being created. And you started to see a progression in the black community. But what ended up happening was white folk real good at tearing our apart. And we real good at not defending our sometimes. And what that ultimately turned into is um, black people not having the tools to build economic, like to do economic development, black people not having the knowledge to build economic, to like do economic development, just all of these pieces. And then functionally what's happened is um, the only way for the people to grow is for the economy of the people to grow. And black people, to my knowledge, are like the only people that's like losing um, like, uh, what is it, net worth over a year, like over time. It's like regressing, which doesn't necessarily make sense because one might look at all these black millionaires and billionaires and be like, oh, what's happening? But actually, that is demonstrative of exactly what we're talking about, which is basically there is a lack of engine or structure to like the overall building of black economic development. Uh, to give you some contrast, the best example of it done right, Marion Barry, Washington, D.C. So there, PG County, Prince George County, Maryland, is has seven of the top ten wealthiest black counties in the country. Like, one through seven of the top wealthiest black counties are in the same state as me. And I was like, how? Why? You go back and you do some digging, you realize they were intentional people building stuff. So you have people like Lil Willie Adams, who was building up the infrastructure and becoming the black bank when there was no banks or lending institutions that would help black people. That then kind of springs forth all of these individuals who go up, go forth and like this help set policy and like do these things. That's where you get the rise of Perry Mitchell. And Perry Mitchell, during basically this big beef that was happening in the 70s between the Democrats and the Republicans about a bill, I mean, about a budget, basically they needed the Black Caucus's vote. And Perry Mitchell, who was the leader of the Black Caucus at the time, basically said the only way you'll get our votes is if you can, like, create a minority set-aside. The minority set-asides have been one of the primary, like, tools of wealth building for black people in the country. And basically what that does is off of every con of every public contract that is issued, basically there's an, a, a set aside amount, a set aside amount that is awarded to minority businesses or women owned businesses. And I think it's 30 and seven. So there's 63% that goes to the prime and then there's subcontractors for the other part. But basically before then, before Parent Mitchell did that, each contract was just whoever it was awarded to. And so what they did when they created the minority set aside is it forced, like it created entrance convergence, right? Where in order for white people to develop their own wealth, they had to be attached to black people. At which point you start getting people like Robert Clay and other individuals kind of springing forth and developing out like the political landscape, pushing all these other things. And basically down in DC, the way that it manifested was basically Perry Mitchell, not Perry Mitchell, um, Marion Barry basically awarded a bunch of black contractors contracts through public money and basically had them do a bunch of construction projects. What that did was it infused a lot of cash into black families. Now what they didn't do well, what people didn't account for was the branding of white people on white stuff. Because basically all of those, the reason why those counties, is seven of them around DC, is because they all were in DC and then they left, like the black flight. And so those counties actually got created as a result of the wealth infusion from the federal government and all of those dollars for the, the minority set aside in the contracts. But that those dollars didn't actually stay there to help build that ecosystem. It actually went somewhere else and likely was filling the other sides. Right now, it's about 2025. Um, we got an organizing team, we got committees, we got math people, and just kind of spread a spread across like that. At our height, we had about 180 employees, but that was probably back in like 2007, 2008, before the last global recession hit. 
because essentially um, what had occurred is Algebra Project started doing vending services for the school district in about 2000. So from 2000 to maybe 2003-ish, we were just kind of doing tutoring services. School district got sued, the Thornton Commission is created, they fixed the funding formula, and as a result, there's a whole bunch of money that's coming into Baltimore City at the time for like after school programs. So we were able to hire more people. And I guess to make it clear, we're able, we are, we explicitly hire you and we target you. And so for every, um, for every set of dollars that I'm able to get in, I'm able to hire another young person. And so it just became one of those things where, um, one, young people need jobs, and not everybody is. There's like a whole bunch of bias in the job market, even though 14 year olds need need money too. And it's actually just a really interesting thing where like people will talk about summer jobs as if their phone bills stop in September or something. Um, but functionally, what ends up happening is just all those students kind of come together, different committees, different pieces of work, different things that they're working on, and just kind of um, determine what we want to do for the year, what the goals are, what the, who the partners will be, whatever that is, and really the young people just decide. It's, it's a lot less of me as an adult determining what is best for young people and more of like, and more of me being um, like Ella Baker, right? Like if um, Ella Baker was a civil rights genius, revolution, she's probably the most, um, undervalued person in the entire movement. But Ella Baker used to sit inside the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's meetings. And when they would meet, she would just sit quietly in the corner, reading a book. If something was going all awry and left field or right field, she would say something, bring it up, but that was about it. It wasn't about controlling. It wasn't about setting an agenda. It wasn't about determining what young people were doing for themselves at the time, it was about creating space, making space, supporting that, and helping facilitate that. It even got so bad at one point where King, Martin Luther King and his cronies from the SCLC had actually come down to SNCC and was trying to like be like, hey yo, get down or lay down, cuz. And then Ella Baker was like, nah, none of y'all wanted to roll out, back up off me. Let them kids do them. And then they was like, yeah, dummy, back up off me. And then he was like, for real? And she was like, scram, show me. And he was like, all right. That's basically what happened. But all that to say, like, Ella Baker in her operations, during a time period where King and his team were very clearly kind of doing the Power Ranger thing, popping up city to city, being like, let's morph, in, let's morph into action mode and move more back out. There was this person who was around and rather than trying to set an agenda and go do things, it was more of, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to help develop your thing out and support that. Yeah. Well, for us, I'm just kind of going back to that, that initial piece about how Algebra Project got created. Um, it was really about access to, or well, it has always been about access to like economic Right, like even that question about well, what is the citizenship going to look like in the future? Before it was voting, we got to be able to vote on certain things, be able to pass certain things, be able to get resources to certain things for you to be able to have stuff where you want it. Then it became access to science and math, and so really it was um, taking the same level of consciousness about an individual act that while it in and of itself may seem isolated and not having it much to do with all these other pieces, it actually very much so has everything to do with it. So like this concept that you could be playing a game of Jenga and somehow be learning math or playing Twister and like somehow be learning math and that still be like a central and integral part um, the, the marriage between those two is really like, what are the things that you need in order to have the life that you want? And that's what organizing really is, is asking those questions and figuring those things out. It just so happens that in like, in American society, in American civil society, um, 
that also looks like math and science. Oh, I mean, basically, I guess the, the short version is standardized testing is basically the, the money. In order for you to get bread, people want to be able to have you on the hook for something. So for the police, you get more money, but we want to see more arrests. And for schools, is you can have more money, but we want to see high test grades. It's the accountability matrix or part of that accountability matrix. But the problem is... Um, when you are talking about developing, raising, building beautiful black children, there's a lot more that goes into that than what goes into building some of those other amazing children. And in those instances, it is one, hard to standardize a test and do that, but two, there's like a clear gap in resources, both from a financial standpoint and a non-financial standpoint. It's like a whole bunch of stuff, and actually what's ended up happening previously is that different states have actually used standardized testing as a means of state-sanctioned violence on urban school districts. So, like, we're going to make sure you don't have the resource that you have, we're going to test you at the end, and when you don't have it, we're going to take over the school district as a as a means to also be able to control some of the resource and some of the like pieces of stuff that's happening there. Mm -hmm. And so um, <clears throat> explain to me kind of what is your slogan? No education, no No education, no life. Explain to me how that kind of culminated. Oh yeah, so that was actually before my time, but there was a, the first advocacy group, 2003, basically, there was a dude, Zachariah Burt, who was a part of like the first advocacy committee, and basically they all kind of came up with the red X as like the symbol for the algebra project, which is basically, it was the mark to show that um, the school district and those who seen black kids in Baltimore City as write-offs, they get written, they literally crossed us out with the big red pen. And so that's where the red X comes from. And the idea is like no educational life, if you can get around those pieces then you'll be all right. Um, that that kind of became like the slogan once we started doing the advocacy work, particularly at the Zach died. So Zach was killed. Um, Zach was an algebra project student. He was killed a few months before I joined algebra project. And at the time he was behind a church on 33rd in the Alameda with two other Algebra Project um, alumni. They were being robbed. They didn't have anything. And so the robber, the assailant, shot Zach in the head. And um, I remember very much so the next few Black Friday meetings and leadership meetings where we were all together. The ones of us who could wrap our heads around it, which I wasn't a part of that regime originally, kept saying, Zach doesn't have a life because that guy didn't have an education. And like, yes, sure, maybe, but in that moment, it's hard to feel that, but then eventually you kind of develop out that understanding and it becomes particularly clear, like even down to the premise, Algebra Project was created to be able to help people get resources because math and science access. Lack of access to math and science, proxy for lack of access to education that then creates the situation where there's this guy robbing these teenagers and shooting and killing one of them. It's literally like how all the pieces are connected in that same way. Um, but really just all of the math work, the organizing work, it's all connected and all um, really important based on the concept of Black self-determination, right? Like this idea that um, you get to help decide your fate or you will be able to decide your fate based on how much work you're able to put in, how much like your support system is able to help do stuff. And that's really what that comes down to. So I guess in short, the major connection between the organizer and the math work is either way, no matter what you're doing in life, you're going to have to figure out how to become the most active and most engaged citizen. 
that you can be because that's the only way to get stuff to do what you need to do to get the results you need but problematic if you try to separate that or compartmentalize that from the educational experience or these other experiences that people have because we live intersectional lives a lack of understanding from whom Everybody, I mean, people hear Baltimore Algebra Project and they assume that all we do is men. There's a bunch of stuff along that line. Um, then there's also like the, there's like a, there is a lack of reconciliation between like school administrations and Algebra Project. Excuse me. In that we have two different goals, right? Like their goal is to get the job done as efficiently and effectively as they could possibly do it. And my job is to get the job done as thoroughly as I can possibly get it done, which is not the same for them. A lot of them, a lot of principals, administrators, their mode of operation, even when it comes down to partners, community partners, vendor partners, whatever, their mode of operation is don't make me look bad. Because the way that the school system is structured in Baltimore City, each principal has a supreme amount of authority and autonomy over their schools, their policies, their budgets to varying degrees. But what that ultimately means is that you live and die on your own sword. So if a principal feels like a particular set of behaviors is not conducive to where they may be, they may or may not be in their process, then it doesn't matter how useful, productive, impactful, valuable that particular thing is to the students. It doesn't reconcile with what they need at the time. And I'm saying that happen from anything from like Teachers, I mean, administrators not necessarily wanting students to go and be in a place at a particular time or all the way down to um, pep rallies and local artists will go and perform. And I've seen administrations get upset with the artists because the students are saying the words from their songs, even if they're playing the clean version. And it's like, you have to know those are your students. Like, that's just it. But there is, when rifts like that happen, oftentimes those who have the power and the authority and the autonomy in those instances tend to just do what they want to do. And that's not real helpful when you've got more than one person in the, in the equation. Oh, we got some, the originally Baltimore City had transportation, like for students it was bus tickets. You got two little week tickets. You got one for the morning, one for the afternoon. And it was over at 6 o'clock. And we started to work on them because basically algebra project meetings were going past that time. And so we got an extension, and that extension actually turned into what's now the S-Pass. So the, the monthly pass that the students have now is actually a direct result of the algebra project work we were doing. Um, there was the Kerwin, there's the Kerwin Commission on educational excellence and innovation or something or other but basically the that's the new version of the Thornton Commission where we've been like working on that stuff um, recently we were able to stop a hundred million dollar youth jail from being built um, that was interesting and we've also like started a bunch of other campaigns and done a bunch of other stuff um, we created what's called the school police report card which is a direct reporting mechanism for students to be able to um, give their feedback about the policing good that they got. And to give some context on that, um, after Mike Brown was killed, Baltimore City had a bunch of conversations about what its school police force should be doing about guns. Now, one, Baltimore City is the only district in all of the 24 districts in Maryland that has its own dedicated school police force. But once they started figuring it out, they started figuring out, trying to figure out whether or not the police officers shouldn't be able to carry their guns in schools. There's legislation that says that they can't. So during this year, I'm like at this particular school board meeting, I'm watching 
school board members, administration, students and school police all duke it out over whether or not this person should be able to carry their gun inside the school building during the day. Which seems like a no-brainer to me, right? Like, why would you even do that? That doesn't make sense. The more guns present, the more likely something is to happen. And um, what became increasingly clear at that point, like after the students had a bunch of meetings about the kind of reflecting on it, was that there was no direct accountability metric. There was no, um, and students are the primary consumer, right? Like if you think about your, if you, healthcare, if you got sick right now, you said, I want to get, I want to go get healthy. You got your primary care doctors, you got Mercy, you got Hopkins, you got all these options. If you, if I was like, yo, come with me out back real quick and then we got jammed up, you got tons of legal options, right? Like whatever, 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 this lawyer, that lawyer. When you think about public safety and you think about policing, you have what you're given. You don't have the ability to go out and shift and look for different options in the marketplace like how you do with other industries. That said, what you have for public safety or policing has to be effective, adequate, or like useful because that's the only option you have. So the idea that there is an entire system of school police who are supposed to be administrating a service to these students, but they never get critiqued on that service, they never get evaluated on that service, they never have any feedback on that service from the primary consumer, it doesn't actually make sense. And so what we did was we created a survey that's gone out to about 8,000 students a year for like the last three years, and basically been chronicling and uh, kind of keeping log of different people's interactions with school police over the time period as a formal cop watch. Ultimately, like one of the goals is to be able to have students to have some firing and hiring ability or capacity over school police because they are operating within their space and their ecosystem. What is the one thing that you think Baltimore City needs in order to thrive, to make stuff equitable? What, what is that thing? And what would it look like? What is the singular thing, if I had to pick one thing that would make Baltimore City thrive? The Goom Squad. Um, back during like the 40s, 50s, not 40s, 50s, the 50s, 60s, 70s, there was a group of eight individuals in Baltimore City called the Goom Squad. Those eight individuals primarily were from over west. One of those people was Billy Murphy's mother. Um, basically, that eight set of people were wealthy, kind of well, uh, decently well off black middle class families or upper class families that were able to basically be the vanguard for the city. They helped put together the institutions, they helped finance and bankroll the politicians who would be in position for some of the, the, the different policies that needed to happen. They basically were the people who, when you came to the city, if you wanted something to happen in Black Baltimore, you had to go through them. And I think what's happened over the course of the last century is just kind of the decay of all of the structures that um, constitute what our communities are made up of, right? Like the individuals, the big homies that say what can and can't happen, the rules for what can and can't happen on the block, the who's gonna be there and who's not gonna be the win, all of those things that go into building a community actually are kind of like disaggregated and it makes it much more of a neighborhood. But then you get black flight and all the rest of the stuff that's going on and then the branding of the city that makes it so that you take the neighbor out there and all you got left is the hood. And who wants to stay in the hood?